Hello guys, how are you doing? I'm Mohammed Sadri. Um, this is uh, lesson number 11, section 2. And in this lesson, I compile the U-boot and the Linux kernel, and actually the device tree of the Linux kernel, and I run them uh, on the Z-board. So practically, in this lesson, we will compile and run the Linux kernel and its related material on the Z-board and we will describe how is the process in detail. Okay, so um, suppose that I want to compile the Linux kernel and also the rest of the uh, Linux related components and then run them on the Z-board on the Zinc device. The best you can do, um, in fact, to learn how you can do it is to refer to Xilinx website. So there is this www.wiki.xilinx.com which contains basically all of the information that you need and it contains the links to all of the source codes that you need to run Linux successfully on your Z board or any other zinc device based system or any microblaze based system or any power pc based system that xilinx is providing so officially or better to say commercially uh, xilinx is provided this peta linux to the users and the peta linux uh, is a kind of everything is ready for you um, actually the commands that you need to issue they are very simple and straightforward and the kernel that comes uh, under the context of peta linux is a very well um, tested kernel and the developers they are sure that it runs without any problem on your arm host i have tried it myself uh, during some projects and it is it's really easy to use so this is what officially they are suggesting to you as uh, the Linux distribution that you can run on your Zinc device okay but there is a but the but is that mm, well this is a commercial uh, product and uh, uh, yeah you can you can get it very easily it's um, very well supported and mm, anyway it needs a license okay so it's not totally free um, yes I emphasize you can get it very easily but it's not totally free so there is this um, open source Linux which is actually um, slightly more difficult to use um, you need a little bit more experience um, compiling the Linux kernel compiling different applications for Linux um, but I personally prefer to use this one because this one it comes um, at no cost basically it is completely free and you don't get dependent on others for the type of development the type of project that you are doing uh, the first one you get dependent on others basically you are using what others are have created for the linux linux kernel and the flow of compiling and bringing up the linux and this is something i don't feel um, good about it so what i'm going to first show you is i want to in fact run the normal open source linux which is completely freely available on my Z Zinc device with a sample uh, root file system and then I want to compile an application on it and to run an application on it so here is our first focus point open source Linux and the first step that I do if I follow this link I will reach here is, is in fact fetch sources so first thing I will do I will fetch the source codes that I need to bring up the Linux kernel to compile and bring up the Linux kernel and that are in fact the Linux itself the U-boot device tree generator and later a root file system 
So I begin with fetching the sources out of the Xilinx Git repository. And how do I do that? It's actually completely written here. You can just copy paste the command that is here. So I want first to fetch the Linux kernel. So I have created a kind of Linux directory here. I, I just, um, in fact, paste this line here. And then for the repository name, I, I use one of these names. So for the for the Linux kernel, we have in fact Linux dash Xilinx dot git. Okay. So I fetch. I begin in fact cloning this git repository, and it may take some time. I um, pause the video recording, and then I come back. Okay, now the download is finished and we have actually downloaded the um, 955 megabytes of data. This is the size of the kernel and here I have it. du-sh linux xilinx, sorry. Yeah, 1.7 gigabytes of data actually is, is kind of decompressed. So 1.7 gigabyte, and now I should download, uh, in fact, fetch from the Git repository the uboot. So, what was the uh, name for the uboot? Is so here is my Git um, clone command, and here I think I can say um, uboot xilinx dot git. Okay, this one is faster, is a small, but again I pause the video and I come back. Okay, now the next part, device tree generator. Okay, the device tree generator is also downloaded. So we have these three items, uboot, the Linux kernel, the device tree, and then uh, it remains the root file system. So actually, first the FSPL will be executed, then uboot, device tree will be loaded into the memory, the Linux kernel will start, and then the final step is the root file system, which should be mounted and then the applications which are on the root file systems they should be executed some of them for the root file system yes of course you can build it from scratch but that's a lot of work and most of the times it is not needed a very good approach is to use a kind of ready to use root file system and just to modify it as you need so for example you take the default root file system that's kind of provided by xilinx and it's here arm ram disk image the gz it's uh, in build and modify a root fs part in the xilinx wiki and you download this file and actually for starting this file and this root file system is completely enough but then during your development, maybe you need to add some extra functionality. And so it's easy to, in fact, unwrap this file to add new files to it and wrap it again. So I download for now this part and then um, we are fine to continue with compiling the Linux kernel and compiling the uboot. The point is that the approach that I'm using here right now is in fact for systems in which you don't need to run the X you don't need to run the graphical environment or um, in fact it's really for a kind of embedded system which will be executed using a console it, it is in a text-based mode and it's not running, running any graphics important point is that the Zinc device does not have any built-in um, graphical processing unit um, as a hard core so as soon as you want to do something with graphics and you want to have a kind of GUI 
then you need to add a GPU core, in fact, on the PL of the zinc. This GPU core can be very simple, actually. It can be really just maybe a video direct memory access controller. And, and at the same time, it can be very complicated. So it really depends on what you are going to do and uh, what type of graphics you want to show. So, uh, so at the moment, we suppose that we don't have this graphical part and we continue with the text part, which is most of the times enough. Indeed, in my view, in fact, I don't see why I should um, consume the precious resources that I have on the PL for a GPU. By that, I mean if I have a very serious, in fact, um, I have the need for a very serious GUI, then what I will do personally, I will put one of these um, SOCs which are widely available in the market, such as the one uh, which is being used in Raspberry Pi or the one which is inside IMX6 um, six series of free scale these devices they are there they have the GPU it supports 2D 3D it works perfect and it's really easy to use everything is developed for that so I think whenever you have a kind of very serious uh, GUI in your project then maybe it's really better to add one of those chip on your PCB and actually to keep your Zing device for more serious computational tasks. Okay, uh, so I will download this and then we will continue with compiling the Linux kernel. Now we want to in fact set up the system so that we can begin compiling uh, the U-boot and the Linux kernel. So I have my notebook. My notebook, notebook is an x86 platform and I want to compile these two guys for the ARM platform. So I want to do a kind of cross compilation. On x86 platform I want to compile a set of C source code for the ARM platform. And in order to do that I need a cross compiler. When you install the software development kit of Vivado, you are practically also installing the cross compiler. I can show you. Here, if I source the settings files of Vivado, then if I press ARM and then tap, you see in fact a list of possible executables. Who are these files? These files are in fact ARM tool chains which are installed on your system along with the software development kit of Xilinx. So now that I want to compile the Linux kernel, in fact I am going to use this tool chain ARM Xilinx Linux dash GNU EBI. Okay, so I'm I'm going to use this set of executables in fact to compile the U-boot and the Linux kernel and in order to do that you should set suitable environment variables that inform the build system of the U-boot and the build system of the Linux kernel about this cross tool chain that you have so if I look uh, for example inside the U-boot I have this make file this make file is the file which contains the instructions to compile the U-boot and practically what we are going to execute next is this make file and this make file needs to know where is the compiler what is the name of the compiler that it should use to compile this C source code of the U-boot that we have here for the target platform there is an environment variable that you set and this environment variable in fact tells the U-boot and tells the Linux kernel what is the name of the toolchain 
that it should use for preparing the executable of the U-boot and the Linux kernel. Here is the cross-compile environment variable that you set with the export command inside your Linux. So the value for cross-compile will be this prefix which is repeating for all of these executables. So I copy and paste this prefix here. Now the build system whenever it wants to for example compile one C source code it will use this prefix it will add the GCC at the end and then it will use the resulting string as the name of the executable that it should run to compile the C source code or for example when the build system needs to copy for example one segment of the ELF from one location to another or it needs to do some operation like that or it needs to obtain some information about the generated ELF then what it does is exactly the same it uses this cross compile variable it takes this string it adds the name of the read ELF at the end and then it uses the name of the resultant string as the program that it should execute to perform the task. Another environment variable that you need to set to compile the Linux kernel is the target architecture. So if I go to the source of the Linux kernel here Linux Xilinx there is an Arch folder if I go to the Arch folder I have a complete list of the architectures for which I can compile the Linux kernel. In fact the Linux kernel is supporting all of these architectures. For example it's supporting our own architecture that we have on the Zinc ARM Cortex A9 in fact 32 bit ARM cores it supports 64 bit ARM cores, AVR32 Blackfin analog devices, CC6 platform Texas instruments, IR64 Intel, um, Microblaze, MIPS, OpenRISC, PowerPC, Spark platforms, and x86, Xtensa. So the Linux kernel can be compiled for all of these platforms. The source code that you download can be compiled for all of these platforms and this is the magical in fact fact about the Linux kernel so you should tell the build system of the Linux kernel for which of these platforms you want to compile the kernel and how you do that you do that with the arch environment variable so I said the arch architecture environment variable to arm and by this I'm telling the build system of the Linux kernel that look I want you to compile the Lin this Linux kernel for me for an arm in fact target okay now you have these two environment variables set and the next step that I do, I go to the U-boot and I begin in fact configuring the U-boot first and then compiling the U-boot for my Zinc target. Now I want to compile the U-boot. My environment variables are set. So I come to U-boot dash Xilinx and here I have the files and this is the main file that I have it's responsible for all of the build process and this is GNU make uh, it's kind of GNU make a script and okay it's a very big discussion for itself what's GNU make for now we don't want to go through that because it takes maybe weeks so what I want to do I first configure this build system and tell it I want to compile U-boot for the Z-board. 
or the other target board that you have. And then after configuration, we go through the compilation process. So in order to configure, in fact, the build system of U-Boot, you, you issue a command, a make command. So it will be make zinc z config. Okay, but what does it mean? What happened right now is that there are a set of predefined configurations that when you issue this command, these predefined comp configurations will be read and the main configuration files of the U-Boot, which will be called during the compilation process, they will be initialized with these configurations. And now if I type make, actually the compilation process itself begins and those configurations will be used to compile the source code of the U-Boot uh, for the Z-Board. So if I go to include configs folder and take a list, I have a large number of files. And what are these files? In fact, they are kind of list of files available for different configurations. And in fact, each file practically corresponds to one board. So it's not always true, but generally this is true. For example, I have a file which corresponds to the configuration that should be used for U-Boot, which is running on the Z board. And it's called zinc underline Z dot H. Or I have a file for ZC702, ZC706. And I have some files for other older configurations. And the point is, there are some files which is shared between all of these guys. This is not only for Xilinx. This is for every platform that the U-Boot can run on. So, for example, you have a complete list of files for different boards which are based on Texas Instrument OMAT platform. You see them here. And generally, if you are building a new board uh, that contains, in fact, a new system on chip device, then maybe you want to you add your own entry for your own board here. And then when users compile the U-Boot for your board, then they can use that entry. So here, if I briefly scheme through zinc underline, underline z dot h, actually it's a very small file and it doesn't contain anything special. The reason for that is that as you see at the end of the file, we are including zinc common dot h which is a file which contains all of the main configurations for the Zinc device. And you know, practically there's no difference, for example, between ZC702 and ZC7 and Z board, because basically they are the same device. Uh, maybe the only thing which, which is really, really different is the amount of memory that you have on ZC702, you have one gigabyte. On Z-Board, you have only 500 megabytes. And this is a kind of configuration which is directly mentioned here. And then there are some other configurations for related to peripherals that we have on the board. And then we are including Zinc Common. And the Zinc Common contains um, all of the general configurations that are used for the ARM host of the Zinc device. Okay, for now, uh, we don't want to go through details of these files. Uh, the fact that we executed uh, make zinc underline z underline config is kind of enough. So the next step, I, co I go back to the root uh, of, of my U-Boot download, and I just issue make, make. And 
Then I wait until, uh, in fact, this making process get finished. So I pause the video. Okay, now the compilation is done. And if I look at the root folder of the U-boot, I have a set of files here. I have the U-boot without any extension. I think this is uh, the ELF file. And then I have some other versions of the compiled U-boot. But I can try right now the ELF file on the board and see if it is working or not. So first step, I check if this file is really an ELF. So what I do, I say arm, xilinx, linux, then read ELF minus H, uboot. And with this command, practically I am reading the information inside the header of this file. In fact, I'm identifying what are the contents of this file. What is this file? And this is the output of read ELF. It's, it's telling me that this file is an ELF32. Uh, it's to complement little endian and it's for ARM host. And then there are a set of other information. So this file, is the one that I can directly run on my ARM host. And let's try it. So I set up my Z board and we load this file into our Z board and we see if it is working or not. Okay, so I open a new tab and then I want to issue, in fact, the picocom command. So I will say sudo picocom minus h. Let's see the available options for picocom again. And then we, we run the picocom. So I say sudo picocom minus minus b, 115, 200, minus minus fn, minus minus pn, and then the device, the dev tty acm0. Make sure that your board is on, your cable is connected correctly. If it failed, just reconnect the cable. I think is the first thing you want to try to reconnect the cable and issue exactly the same command. Okay, anyway, terminal is ready. And my next step, I want to, in fact, run this thing on my Z board. So I would say XMD and then I will wait a little bit and then I will connect to my ARM hardware. And if it didn't connect, again, we can reissue the command. The first thing we will try, but it's connected. And now I do the U-boot, do U-boot. Uh, yeah, obviously, I made a mistake here. I connected to the zinc and then I issued though you would command directly. It's wrong because I have turned on the board right now. And what should I first do is to initialize the PS. And in order to do that, I need one of my PS7 underline init.tcl files or I need to run FSPL. So, Let's find FSPL from somewhere. I don't know where I am. Okay, I need an FSPL. Just I've paused the video and I find one and I come back to you. Okay, I have found one PS7 underline init.tcl. This file, I have talked about it a lot of times. And um, it's required for initializing the PS. Of course, the PS7 underline init.tcl file that you use uh, should have a set of peripherals on the PS enabled. For example, the UART, we need it, the Ethernet, we need it. So if, if you have 
a PS underline 7 init.tcl in which all of these peripherals are disabled, don't use that because it will not work. But I think the one that we generate in a default mode with Vivado with a Zinc project that should work. And now I am trying one of those files. So I say source, I think PS7 underline init. I hope it's correct init.tcl and then ps7 underline init and then i say do u boot enter and now this time obviously the u boot gets loaded into the dram because the dram is initialized ps7 init is executed and now i can have a have an eye in fact on my terminal and 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 run the u boot so let's say run enter and we will run and here we see in fact the output of the u boot so here i have the board is dialing zinc obviously ecc is disabled and a set of in fact outputs so our um u boot that we compiled just some minutes ago it's working fine and u boot is a complete system for itself it has a large number of commands each command can come handy in a specific situation uh, it has it has a very high level of flexibility you can do many many different things with it but for now um, the uboot is working i go ahead with compiling the linux kernel itself so um, I come back here to my folder that in which I have the Linux kernel source code. Before I go ahead and compile the Linux kernel, there is one point about U-boot, and there is one thing that you need to do. The point is that when uh, the build system of the Linux kernel wants to create the final image of the Linux kernel. It needs to create a kind of image that U-Boot understands that image and can load that image, in fact, into the memory. And that's called a U-Image. We will see it soon in a few minutes. But in order to create a U-Image, there is an executable here which will be required by the build system here. So before you begin compiling the Linux kernel, you need to add a folder here inside you with your path environment variable so that the Linux build system can see that specific executable. So I once more go back, in fact, to the you would source folder and then I go inside the tools folder and then here I have the make image utility which will be used for creating the U image of the kernel. So I add this folder to my pass environment variable. So export pass is equal to dollar pass dollar uh, in fact current current working folder. Okay. So now I have M make image as kind of utility which can be seen from every location in my Linux and now I come Linux Xilinx and now I am completely ready in fact to compile the Linux kernel okay so now I am in the folder which contains the Linux kernel source and first step let's make sure that we are beginning from a scratch so the source code let's make sure it's ready it's clean and now so you have the source code and the build process actually contains two steps first you should do the configuration of the building process so what items should be built 
which items should be kept inside the Linux kernel, which items should be kept as modules, what are the parameters for, in fact, uh, different parts of the Linux kernel, how the memory will be managed, and so on, and these things. So in order to do that, uh, what you need to do is a kind of command which is called make menu config. So as you issue the make menu config, you will be given an environment in which you can configure all of these different options. Okay? Uh, but usually um, it needs a high level of expertise and experience and a very high level of patience to configure all of these items one by one correctly. So what true time has happened is that a set of default configs are uh, created by people and these default configs are in fact the configurations that most of the times are used and you can simply just use one of those default configs. So for applying one of those default configs I can say make xilinx zinc dev config it's it's like i'm issuing the menu config and i'm setting there a set of configurations but someone else has done that for me and i use just those default configurations and the result will be written in fact into the dot config file dot config file and this file is the file that will be used during the compilation of the Linux kernel. So um, next step, I just want to do the compilation process itself. And as I told you, I want to create the U image. In fact, I want to create the Linux kernel. I want to compile all of these source codes of the Linux kernel. Then I want to create the image, the executable of the Linux kernel. And then I want to create it in a format that the U-Boot understands that format, can read that format, can copy it into the memory in a suitable location, and then can pass, in fact, the program counter of the CPU to, to the Linux kernel. So I say make U image, I press enter, and the build process of the Linux kernel begins. It takes maybe five minutes. Okay, now uh, we have reached, in fact, the end of the compilation of the Linux kernel. And as you see in the log, the Z image is ready. The Z, what is Z image? The Z image is, in fact, your Linux kernel in a compressed form. And from the Z image, um, in fact, it should be created the U image which then uh, the U will, will use, in fact, to load the Linux kernel and then later to boot it. So here I have a kind of error, uh, which says I want to create U image, but the load address um, on the command line is not specified. And so, uh, I reissue, in fact, the my make you image command, and this time I give, in fact, the make an address for you image, um, an address uh, to which then later this you image will be loaded. So I will look. Uh, I will for now. I will do exactly the same as what Xilinx is doing. So. I set the address as what they are suggesting. You image load address. And now this one should take a very short time because actually we have compiled the Linux kernel successfully and only we want to create the U image. So 
now you image is ready it's in arch arm boot you image okay so I have the U boot I have the Linux kernel and kind of I have the root file system on which there are the applications of the Linux itself I mean the programs that will be executed in the Linux and then the only thing which is my in my story missing is the device tree and the device tree is a kind of file that contains the information of the hardware on which the Linux is going to execute and this information will be passed to the Linux kernel by the U-boot so I should create the device tree and then we can test the Linux kernel so if I go to the Arch folder and then from there I go to the arm if there is any yeah arm and then there I go to the boot folder I see the Z image I see the U image and then there is a folder which is called DTS and if I go inside this folder I see a large number of files they are all ending with .DTS and these are the device tree files you can create your own device tree file using the device tree generator the one that we downloaded from the git repository of Xilinx but maybe for our first test it's better to use a kind of default device tree that we have for our target board so we have here zinc-z.dts and let's see what it is okay it's a file text based of course with a special structure and it contains the key parameters that should be passed to the Linux kernel so that it can be executed on your target hardware uh, information about the memory information about the parameters that you pass to the Linux kernel at the first point that it wants to execute for example you tell the Linux kernel which hardware component in the system should be used as the console the console is in fact a hardware component to which the Linux kernel copies the log of the messages so whenever in fact the print k command or then later at user space the print f command they are executed there should be a piece of hardware there should be a u there should be an uart to which the linux kernel copies this data and the console is indicating in fact the specification of that specific hardware then there is the root parameter which is indicating in fact the address on which the Linux kernel can find the root file system and as I told you the root file system contains the normal files of the Linux its applications the programs that will be executed when the Linux comes up so here I'm indicating that the root file system will be placed on the RAM in fact it will be a RAM disk we don't have any physical disk on our Z board for now for the root file system then the kernel will be mounted read write and then um, I'm asking in fact the kernel to show a more complete log of its operation so we have early print k mm, we have the print k's which are happening in the initial phase of execution of the Linux kernel also on our console um, yeah so uh, now if I go through the file I can see information related to different parts of the hardware that I have on my Z board and what I see here is that this file is including another file which I think is a kind of general configuration file for um, so it's this guy 
here. It, it's a kind of, uh, it's for me first time I'm seeing this. The information, the configuration for the CPU and yeah, performance measurement unit, the buses, information of the hardware, uh, different c hardware uh, components that you have on the PS so the information of them they are all here so yeah in, in the old days all of this information there will in, in in just one file now they have created a kind of common file and they have moved the common information there in, into this file so it's, it's it doesn't matter and the point is now I want to use this device tree and in order to do that, I need to compile it. And how do I compile a device tree? There is in fact a utility inside the Linux kernel source code, which comes with the Linux kernel source code. And you can use that utility to um, compile the device tree. So it's inside the tools folder. And then I think it I should go inside the scripts oops no it's not inside the scripts it's inside the scripts it's here inside the scripts sorry it's not inside tools script it's inside the script and then here I have a folder which is called DTC and inside DTC I have an executable which is called DTC okay and this is the device tree compiler and let's see if it uh, it gives me any kind of in fact set of options that I can have so this is DTC how I issue DTC is options input file and so DTC options input file so what I need to do is in fact I give the tool um, my zinc z dts input file and I will also tell it uh, what kind of output I want um, uh, this guy to generate for me okay so um, let's go back to the folder which was containing the DTS file arch arm boot DTS and then let's call the DTC a scripts DTC DTC minus O the name of the file that I want to generate zinc Z I think the D T B in fact compiled compiled device tree the DTB it's, it's it's not binary it will not be text anymore and then at the type of file I want it to be a DTB. Okay, we issued the command, and the only thing which is uh, in fact remaining in my command is the name of the file itself, the input file, so things that the DTS. And now, uh, in fact, I have the DTB file. So I have the DTB file, I have the U image. I have the U-boot. I have everything I need to test my Linux kernel on my Z board. Okay, now I want to test my Linux kernel on the Zinc board. I have the U image. I have the device tree, compile device tree. I have the RAM disk and then inside this folder I have the U-boot and now the first step in fact to test the Linux kernel I should convert this RAM disk that I have here 
into a kind of RAM disk that the U boot understands. So the same procedure as or the same story as what we had for the Linux kernel from the Z image to U image we have also for the RAM disk for the root file system from in fact the compressed root file system to a kind of U RAM disk for a root file system that is specific to U boot so I use the MK image the utility that I talked about and I convert the RAM disk that we have here um, from the compressed RAM disk to U RAM disk okay now I have the U RAM disk U image device tree I turn on my Z board and then I run the picocom and then I have the picocom here the first step is what we have done previously is to run uboot so xmd connect arm hardware source ps7 underline init.tcl ps7 underline init my ps is now initialized then do uboot xilinx uboot the uboot is loaded into the DRAM memory of my Z board run the uboot is executed so I have it here this is the uboot and now what I should do I should stop the uboot and I should copy the device tree the uram disk and the u image into the DRAM memory of my Z board okay and the point is that I can copy these data wherever I like they are not big but I should copy them in fact into correct locations okay in order to do that I need to first calculate some addresses to which I copy this data okay so um, <clears throat> let's do our calculation let's bring a calculator and then here in the calculator I know that my zinc board it has total 512 megabytes of DRAM memory so let's put the Linux kernel at 256 so 256 uh, uh, 1 megabyte in hexadecimal so let's uh, put the URAM disk here um, so what I do I say <coughs> do minus data it's data it's pure data um, it's not an ELF it should be treated like data so U RAM disk and then the address is uh, this number that you see here and actually it is okay so I'm copying the URAM disk from my notebook to the DRAM memory of my Z board this takes a little bit time I pause the video and I come back to you okay copying the URAM disk is done it's kind of a slow to transfer all of these data over the JTAG cable to the board <coughs> so later in future videos I show you how you can transfer the data over the network so <coughs> we will have a kind of TFTP server on our notebook running and then the U-boot will grab all of these images over the network 
from the TFTP server. But for now, we have used the JTAG cable to transfer the URAM disk. And now, uh, let's put the Linux kernel uh, somewhere after. So I bring uh, my calculator again and save this address. This is the address for URAM disk. And now um, I <coughs> I put the Linux kernel maybe at um, maybe at I would say 50 megabytes later. So 50 multiplied by 2000. Okay, I put the Linux kernel here at this address. So, control C, do, do minus data, U image at this address, at this address. Again, this while takes a this one takes a while, so. I pause the record. Okay, now we reach the final part. So so far, I have copied the I have copied the U image at this address, the U RAM disk at 50 megabytes earlier, and now there is the device tree, which should be also transferred, in fact, to the memory of the Z board and I put that again 50 megabytes later so plus 50 okay I put my copy do data I think its name was Zinc Z the DTB and supposed to be here. This one is a small, it gets done very fast. And now you have all of the data that you need to in fact run the Linux. So I say con continue. What does it mean? It means that the U boot is allowed to continue. So again my ARM host is operating and here now I have all of the data on the DRAM memory of my board so I issue the boot m command the boot m command is responsible for initiating the boot process of the Linux kernel and as the first parameter to the boot m command you pass the address at which the U image is residing so <coughs> the address was I don't remember what was the address. The address was that's yeah, is this number? So I copy and paste actually this number. The second address is the address at which the URAM disk is residing. It was this number, and then the final address is the address at which I have the device tree so it's this number okay now I press enter the boot process should begin and actually I should see the log of the Linux kernel running and let's see what happens okay so what happened is that from when I issued the command uh, of here yeah so here I have issued the command then actually what I see is a set of uh, um, in fact extracting the images and verification of the contents of the images actually for the URAM disk and the image kernel and then you see 
booting Linux on physical CPU 0 and then you see the Linux kernel is in fact executing and different parts of your hardware are getting initiated one by one the level 2 cache controller the second CPU as you know your Zinc device has two CPUs then um, Um, the DMA engine, the network engine, um, yeah, there's a kind of system to control the voltage, the supply voltage. Yeah, so different parts of the hardware, they all get executed one after another. And then what happens is that at one specific point, in fact, execution of the Linux kernel gets kind of finished or gets kind of finalized so at that point which is practically if um, <coughs> yeah here so the execution of the Linux kernel I mean the initialization tasks which were required um, to be done by the Linux kernel at the first stage they are done and we reach a step that the Linux kernel mounts the root file system which is actually the URAM disk and then uh, begins executing the init.sh the initial uh, script on your uh, root file system and here are the results the outcomes and you have the in fact sorry you have the command prompt of your in fact Zinc device running Linux so this is now the Linux running on your Zinc device and let's see CPU info yeah so here is the CPU info oh let's see what do we have more we have a lot of things uh, here it's a complete uh, Linux system so I want to show you mem info mem info and uh, so uh, you have list of processes being executed on your Zinc device so you have the Linux kernel obviously your Linux system is running there it's operational and it can be customized by you we will describe this later in a future video so we can add files to this image we can remove files from this image and uh, we have that is it for now there's still a lot of things to discuss but I put it for future videos okay once more I'm Mohammed Sadri and I'm creating these videos for myself they are coming at no guarantee of correctness of content but I think they can be useful for some people to do their tasks faster and uh, yeah donations are welcome because actually I can use them for the next version of the hardware that I use for the video so if you make one I will be thankful and yeah that is it thanks for watching bye